So the learning objectives of this um, uh, lecture is to get, get an overview of injection therapies, list the substances and preparations used, and also outline indications for injection therapies and specifically a focus today on the lower limb. And as well, a little excursion why I find um, ultrasound guidance is important. This sentence I've put in because I was trained as a sports and exercise medicine uh, physician at Queen Mary uh, University of London. And uh, as this is quite a multidisciplinary course, for me, injections is only one part of the puzzle. Um, looking also, you know, how patients rehabilitate biomechanics, nutrition, and injections are only there to assist uh, this process. Yeah, And I also put in their mental fitness because often these things are um, with anxieties, uh, which also can be addressed uh, if you look at it holistically. So the outline, um, injections, the, the focus will be on osteoarthritis because that's where most of the research uh, is about, mainly knee, but we also look at hip and ankle. Then there's lots used in tendons, plantar fascia. We uh, come to the MCL and uh, in professional sports, there's a lot of discussion about muscle injuries. And uh, when we discuss about lower limb injuries, I feel also we should speak about reticular pathologies. So what injections are used? Well, steroids, well, which ones? Hyaluronic acids, platelet-rich plasma. I will touch on the, on the German medications, Tromel and Actovegan, and on uh, prolotherapy um, and on autologous uh, stem cells, and a little bit of excursion to epidurals as well. So steroids have been used for a very long time, indeed since the 50s for, for knee inflammation and knee pain. And we, we know that it's actually quite effective for temporary relieving symptoms in osteoarthritis. Yeah. What is the most used steroid? Uh, trimcinolone. I think most of us use this for intraarticular injections and the duration uh, in the joint is around two weeks. So often we find doing those injections, they're only short term. As steroids is still the most used substance, I looked into, does it actually work? I found a quite interesting study, which was uh, performed already in 2003 in Montreal, um, where uh, the researchers compared steroid injections to saline injections given every three months. And the steroid group actually showed uh, improved function and pain with no side effects recorded. At the time, they also looked at uh, x-rays um, at follow-up and showed that there was no joint space uh, loss. A similar study has been repeated in 2017, which actually did not find a difference between the two groups and that there was a cartilage loss on MRI scan. So, so I thought for myself, let's have a closer look at how do steroids actually work on the cartilage. And I found this um, study in 2015, published by a German uh, sports medicine uh, physician who works in Switzerland, who looked at how steroids work uh, on the cartilage. And she showed that um, steroids are actually a time and dose dependent effect on cartilage, meaning that if you um, uh, inject a low dose, it might be actually um, beneficial for the cartilage. If it's a high dose, it might be negative for the cartilage. So my approach to steroids is uh, try to use only the lowest dose necessary to achieve what you want to achieve. Hyaluronic acids have been also around for a while, and everybody knows of us, uh, they do exist in our joints. And if you do inject them, they have shown to stimulate the endogenous synthesis of hyaluronic acid, promote chondral protection, and you reduce uh, hyaluronic acid degradation. And this also decreases uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, which is a little bit of an anti-inflammatory as well. Uh, looking at the research of this, there's actually already since 2006 a Cochrane review out, which showed in 40 placebo-controlled trials that hyaluronic acids are beneficial for pain and function. And what is particularly interesting is that this uh, effect is more delayed at 5 to 13 weeks. Um, that's why I, I approach this with my personal take on this due to the short-term effects of steroids and the longer-term effects of hyalurons. I often combined those two with a low-dose steroid 
and and the hyaluron usually longer acting hyaluron in osteoarthritic patients especially in moderate and severe osteoarthritis this is a meta analysis looking into hyaluronic acids uh, different preparations and i circled for you that there are actually quite a lot of preparations out there which show a positive effect on uh, osteoarthritic symptoms of the knee but the question i think remains which hyaluron is the best? Looking at uh, research comparing lower molecular weight to high molecular weight, I found this comparative study which actually showed no difference in improvement of joint stiffness, stiffness joint function, and pain relief. Um, there has been recently uh, some new evidence looking at long-term outcomes at, at higher molecular weight um, hyalurons, and uh, this is a six-year cohort study with quite a few patients uh, finding that actually one injection of a higher molecular weight hyaluron has um, a sustained effect even 466 days after this one injection. And this can even be prolonged by repeating this injection. I just want to mention, I couldn't find any long-term outcomes for uh, um, low molecular weight hyaluron. And I'm, I'm happy to hear <laughs> if, if there are any out. <laughs> the next we're going to talk about is PRP. And uh, PRP is probably at the moment the most uh, discussed injection therapy out there. And I think it's most discussed because it's quite hard for us, for everybody to differentiate different preparations. And the hypothesis of PRP is actually quite appealing. I mean, you can take your own blood and, and inject it and it has a positive effect. And um, looking at what we know is it is for sure that higher platelet counts are better than than um, lower platelet counts to reduce osteoarthritic symptoms. What is still under discussion is what is the role of the leukocytes. And for osteoarthritis, I, I couldn't find a comparative study regarding osteoarthritic uh, symptoms, but we'll come to this later. There seems to be some more evidence for tendons. I think the discussion is out there and I'm looking forward for the further research and particularly in uh, classifying uh, PRPs and uh, being able to compare different preparations. Uh, having said this, uh, there are actually a few systematic reviews out there which um, have shown positive effects of PRP on symptoms of osteoarthritis. And even more interestingly is uh, that if you compare PRP to hyaluronic acid, is that uh, PRP seems to be even more advantageous uh, than, than hyaluronic acids, uh, in particular at three and 12 months uh, post-injection. I'm also aware that there have been some more recent studies uh, who didn't show an effect of uh, PRPs in knee osteoarthritis, but again, I think that needs to be looked at what preparations and how this can be better uh, stratified in research. Over the years, some of us have adopted the practice to combine PRP and hyaluronic acids. And I found two uh, systematic reviews uh, which actually confirmed this. And um, looking into from when does this happen, it's quite interesting that from three and particularly from six months, uh, this effect of using both uh, PRP and hyaluronic acid is uh, especially good. And this can last up to one year. Therefore, my personal take on this, I've been using uh, a combination of uh, PRP plus uh, hyaluronic acid um, with young patients, uh, especially after ACL uh, um, surgery who developed early arthritis or with patients uh, with cartilage defects. And the good thing about it, sometimes it's only one injection you need, which can last up to one year. Obviously, we can discuss there's also cost implications and depending on in which healthcare system you work, that, that's a discussion you also have to have with your patient. So having shown you some evidence, and that's probably the best evidence out there with um, injection therapies, which are mainly done in knees, what about other joints? My personal experience with hip osteoarthritis is that certainly um, a joint um, which is hard to reach with injection therapies. And um, I found a systematic review in, in the BGSM in 2021, which confirms this, that there's actually no evidence of any injection therapy uh, for hip osteoarthritis. But 
having said this, you get sometimes asked to do injections. And uh, my personal take on this is I've been using injection therapies in hips in particularly uh, when surgeons uh, feel that at the moment there is no need uh, for uh, surgery on, on patients with labral tears or impingement and uh, they have not pro been progressing with rehabilitation to use it as a short term reduction of the inflammation and the pain so that patients can rehabilitate better or to use it uh, as a diagnostic tool, which um, is often done in conjunction with uh, a surgeon to see uh, if, if the hip pathology is the real pathology. Coming to the ankle joint, um, there's also quite a bit of research out there. I found uh, this um, randomized controlled trial, which uh, obviously has been uh, discussed uh, quite widely, and uh, uh, this randomized controlled trial could not find any benefit of, of using PRP in ankle osteoarthritis. And uh, having used it myself, um, it also has been not as good effects as with the next point, uh, hyaluronic acids. And hyaluronic acids, there's actually some uh, good systematic review evidence that it can help um, modify symptoms in ankle uh, osteoarthritis. I've also put in there personal take shared decision making because I always feel um, we are in an in a age of um, evidence-based medicine where we look always at evidence, but also we should look at personal experience of the practitioner and personal choices of our patients. And if you can go with your patients through um, the pros and cons, discuss the research and what options there are that they can make an informed decision, I think that's uh, for me the approach also with injection therapies to come to a conclusion if this is the right treatment together with the patient. So coming next to prolotherapy, Glucose injection, this has been used for a long time, I think also even from the 50s. And this has recently um, had, a, again, a revival of being used more and more. And uh, again, the proposition is, is really compelling. It's a non-surgical regenerative injection technique that introduces small amounts of irritants, mainly uh, 25 to 20% 20, uh, uh, glucose, which you um, inject onto tendons, uh, ligaments, and uh, into the joint space. And it has shown to promote growth of normal cells and tissue, and particularly uh, stimulate uh, fibroblasts. For knee osteoarthritis, there have been recently uh, two publications which I found quite interesting and useful. The, the first one uh, was a, a blinded uh, trial which um, used the um, the traditional way of prolotherapy, which means that they injected five mils of 25% uh, dextrose into the knee joint, but also addressed uh, injection points along, along the MCL, the lateral collateral ligament, and uh, pain points around the knee. And th th this study has been then done again, but by only using um, five mils of 25% dextrose into the knee. And the outcomes were actually quite good. Therefore, I've been using it uh, in my daily practice, and particularly with patients who didn't respond to PRP or hyaluronics, and patients trying to avoid um, knee replacements. And despite my numbers being low over the last four years, I had quite positive outcomes, even on the long term. Uh, obviously, just some case studies from myself. Go going away from joints, coming to tendons, and Tendons obviously is often a hard um, uh, pathology to treat. And over the years in the past, the only options there was uh, is steroids. And over the years, steroids had more and more a negative uh, view using them. And, and we know that uh, steroids, uh, particularly into the tendon, but also around the tendon have uh, negative effects. Even um, the tendons can uh, rupture. Um, having said this, all of us know that there are some miracle, miracle cures where we have injected in the past around the tendon a steroid and, and the patient was after one injection cured. And for myself, I ask myself always in the early phase of tendinopathy, might there be some inflammation and might there be a future of other medications or other uh, uh, injection therapies which might be able to address the early phase of um, uh, tendinopathy. So I'm looking forward for some more research in, in, in this and I'm aware that there's some going on. Overall, I want to say about steroids, 
be cautious around tendons. Um, always consider risks and benefits. So this is an um, ultrasound um, of a Achilles tendon, and you can see that Achilles tendon thickened uh, with some neovessels uh, growing in. Why I'm giving you this picture is, I, I told you I've been trained at um, Queen Mary, and um, for this I, I probably I need to mention high volume injections. And um, this injection therapy has been developed by the group at Queen Mary with Otto Chan, Tom Crisp, Natalia. Um, and uh, I'm very grateful for them uh, to have trained me. And at the time, I think the thinking was, uh, what was there as an option for patients uh, who didn't rehabilitate well? There was surgery. And surgery um, for Achilles tendinopathies can cause scar tissue. There's a, a relatively high infection rate compared to other operations. And uh, the group thought, well, we, we can try this uh, by uh, doing an injection and uh, separating the blood vessels and nerves uh, from the tendon. The, the advantage with this injection is um, that patients can go back to full sport after two weeks. Um, what has been used, um, at the beginning we used 10 mils of Marcane uh, and 40 mils of normal saline, and at the time um, also a steroid, which has been subsequently um, taken out of this. Technically, you find with the ultrasound uh, the thickest part of the tendon, uh, where the most neovessels are, medial approach, also quite important. Um, you, you progress the needle behind the Achilles tendon. I've been told you always need to see the bevel. You need to turn the bevel around. And then while you inject uh, the substance up to uh, 40 to 50 mils, you progress the needle frontwards and backwards to release adhesions and reduce uh, uh, the, the blood vessels coming in. This is an ultrasound picture of the Achilles tendon showing the neovessels and the thickened tendon. This is a picture just right after the uh, high volume uh, injection. So what is the evidence? There's only one uh, randomized uh, double-blinded uh, prospective study out there uh, published in 2017, which compared the high volume injection and yes, in this study, there was uh, still a steroid uh, included uh, with the technique I earlier described. Compared to four PRP injection, 14 uh, days apart, uh, and compared to placebo, which was just a saline injection. And this showed that uh, there was an improvement in all, of all groups, but the best um, improvement was with the high volume injection, second PRP, third eccentric exercises only. Um, the authors include uh, concluded that high volume and guided injections uh, help to improve uh, the outcome of, of this condition, at least in the short term. I've also included the original study published in 2008, which showed um, a beneficial effect. There's also some discussion, do they work or, or don't they work? And um, I particularly liked uh, the study from Patrick Wheeler, which actually showed that high volume injections are dose dependent um, um, injection, meaning that you need a minimum um, liquid of at least 40 mils. Um, and you can adjust this uh, obviously to how patients react during the injection. But I would say on average with 50 mils, uh, um, you, you're doing uh, fine here. Yeah. Moving um, to PRP and Achilles tendons. Again, um, I found um, one randomized controlled trial uh, which uh, compared PRP injections to saline injections, which uh, did not result in a greater improvement in pain and activity. There was one systematic review which uh, proposed that there are good retrospective uh, studies suggesting an advantage of using PRP, but there's no evidence of higher level uh, studies to support uh, its efficiency. My personal take so far on PRP uh, around Achilles tendon is I've been using it as a anti-inflammatory when there's peritendinitis or bursitis, in particularly uh, in athletes where you want to avoid a steroid. And I have to say rehabilitation, shockwave in particular, focused shockwave or high, high volume injections um, have been enough in most cases. But there are some cases who don't improve. And I think this is something I will discuss in the next few slides, which are intratendinous tears. And this is a different discussion.
I also found um, some favorable outcomes uh, in prolotherapy, um, in prolotherapy, uh, in Achilles tendinosis, and this was a, a large uh, non-blinded uh, uh, trial. So I've asked myself, looking at the evidence and looking at the uh, practice, what people do, uh, why might PRP or prolotherapy sometimes work? And uh, I think there's this, um, well, um, in, in the publication from Otto Charlie says, intratendinous tears of the Achilles tendon, a new pathology. Uh, but I think that's something which should be considered looking at injection therapies and uh, distinguishing between tendinopathy and intratendinous tears, especially when they don't improve. And we actually did a, uh, a case series which showed um, good outcomes of prolotherapy in intratendinous Achilles tears. So looking at intratendinous tears. On the left-hand side, you can see a ultrasound uh, picture of Achilles tendon. Uh, where you see a hypoechoic area, which uh, shows an intratendinous tears. Sometimes this needs um, obviously a, a better educated eye or, or sometimes a better machine on top of it, um, uh, finding those tears. Um, on MRI scan on the right hand side, it's, it's a high signal area. And here it's just on the lateral side. Maybe some of you uh, recognize these patients. They often have um, a background of uh, long-standing Achilles tendinopathy, and they're complaining to you with a sudden onset of localized pain. Um, and the same is on examination. You've got the signs of Achilles tendinopathy and um, the findings on ultrasound and MRI I've showed you. So at Queen Mary, we approached this, and that's the case uh, series uh, uh, we published with a injection of one mil of 25% uh, uh, glucose into the intratendinous tear, followed by uh, immobilization in a boot for four to six weeks, followed by a rehabilitation uh, protocol or progressive loading protocol. Moving on uh, to patella tendinopathy. Patella, again, it's probably a bit harder to reach with injection therapies. Um, and looking at the studies uh, for high volumes, there is some short-term uh, positive effects. The mixed results on PRP and prolotherapy, ha having found one systematic review, um, the, the publication again mentions that PRP is a safe uh, injection and promising, but however, th there has been no um, proven benefits compared to physical therapy. For this, I think my clinical approach always has been, if people don't uh, improve with a heavy slow resistance program and often you know the physios know better uh, sometimes the heaviness or the heavy slow resistance programs needs to be adjusted if this can't be done because of pain we should address also this pain and i, I usually address it first with shockwave gtn patches have had um, some positive studies lately and if this fails uh, to try a high volume again without a steroid having said this if on ultrasound you can see a, a, a small tear, um, it's worthwhile considering either leukocyte-rich plasma or uh, 20 to 25 percent of uh, glucose. Again, in all these injection therapy decisions, patients get referred to you after they had six months, a year of rehabilitation failed with shockwave. And you always need to discuss this with the patient because the next question is, what is the patient's next option? And if people want to go back quickly into sport, you know, the, obviously the next option will be maybe surgery. So sometimes it might be worthwhile considering uh, these injections, even if the evidence is is at this point uh, uh, not strong enough uh, to make it wide, widespread. So message, shared decision making together with the patient. Through looking through the literature, I actually found uh, these two um, studies, which uh, um, looked at gluteal tendinopathy, chronic gluteal tendinopathy, with sometimes a long length of symptoms, having tried everything, and they compared a leukocyte-rich plasma um, with a steroid injection, which was an ultrasound-guided injection into the tendon. And why I found those studies interesting is because it was one injection into the tendon, which showed a benefit up to two years. I think the question is, because it was a comparative study to steroids, the question is, was it a negative effect of the steroid or positive uh, effect of the PRP? But I feel like that 
this seems to be a quite a good option to use in patients uh, who didn't improve with shockwave rehabilitation and postural advice. But as I said, stepwise approach, least invasive first, but possibly leukocyte rich plasma, good option for gluteal tendinopathy. Uh, going away from tendons, muscle injuries, particularly in professional sports uh, where uh, we want to get players back as quickly as possible, we're looking for how can we do this. Looking at the literature, I, I actually find uh, found this um, editorial in 2010 quite interesting, um, which uh, said, yeah, it's a very good proposition with PRP. We might get some growth factors. So this might heal uh, quicker. Yeah, But if you look at muscle injuries, it's an actively healing acute inflammatory entity where there's already a lot of uh, blood flow there. And indeed, you've got a hematoma. And, and the worry is if you um, introduce some uh, growth factors like uh, um, growth factors which can increase uh, fibrosis, there's the potential to adversely uh, affect the healing process. So. The proposition in this um, uh, editorial was, at this time, there are too many questions to use uh, injections. I found also two systematic reviews, um, which did not find a positive effect of PRP in the muscle. But I'm well aware that there are some uh, studies in muscle injuries which show a positive effect. And that's why I come to this uh, picture. This is um, a picture out of the book from Dr. Müller Wolfert, um, who has been treating muscle injuries for a long time. Um, this is a series of um, needles going along the medial border of the gastrocnemius, and you can see in the middle um, there's uh, the two needles show uh, blood coming out. Um, so, from an injection therapy point of view, um, I've been draining under ultrasound guidance uh, big hematomas out of these. Um, uh, big muscle injuries. That's one thing. The other thing, if you think about uh, what happens, especially when you have a muscle tear, the muscle tears, the muscle contracts, the patient uh, feels pain. Looking at the needle positions, it, it looks like dry needling uh, with some acupuncture needles. And I feel that if you if you use this technique, you can already relax the muscles and patients can rehabilitate possibly better than if they're in a state of pain for a longer time. The question obviously remains, can we introduce some medications into the lesion to uh, speed this process up? And therefore, I've been asked actually to include um, the German medications, uh, which are widely used in, in, in Germany and, and in Switzerland and the German speaking uh, world. One is called Tromel. And um, interestingly, it has been used over the counter in Germany for 60 years. A uh, German physician in the 30s, he thought, oh, let's combine some botanical and mineral substances to produce normal natural medicine to treat musculoskeletal injuries. And uh, the herbal medicines he put in are actually make sense and have shown in some studies that they reduce pain, inflammation, and wound healing. And yes, in my practice in Switzerland, I've been using this on occasions. The other medications Müller Wolf had used um, is Actovegin. And Actovegin is um, deproteinized calf's blood. And there are about 200 different substances in it. Uh, and it has been used in spe specifically in Central Europe for over 60 years. And I've, I've read studies where, uh, especially in Russia, they've used it for, for strokes. And it actually has shown to increase oxygen uptake um, also on muscles and around tendons. Looking into sports medicine. I, I found uh, one um, a publication uh, out of the Fortis Clinic in London, who are obviously known to treat uh, Premier League uh, players. And, and they have actually showed in a non-randomized observational study uh, that Actovegin um, is an exciting and legal alternative for high-performance athletes. And they've shown in their uh, pilot study that they have reduced um, the time returning back to sport. But again, this needs to be studied uh, further, um, and I hope uh, that there will be other research coming out in the future with possible other substances. I come to this also in a moment. Um, when we speak about lower limb injuries, tendinopathies, and in particular muscle, muscle injuries, I feel we need to speak also about the spine, because the spine uh, can affect this in two ways. 
One way, you have some nerve root irritation. This nerve root irritation can cause your muscle to be in high tension, be a bit more, have more spasticity and make you prone for injuring your muscle or even if you have this long-term cause tendinopathy. Um, the other way around is if you have a muscle injury, um, the muscle contracts, you have pain, the pain is transmitted via the spine and the spine can be a, a good um, uh, mechanism to actually undermine the process of, of pain and just shut the pain up for, for a moment. And this again is uh, the picture out of uh, Dr. muller wolfart's book. And, and you see in the middle, um, there are needles positioned uh, to do um, epidural injections and then along the spine uh, uh, injections uh, along the facet joints and also uh, the iliolumbar ligaments. On my search for evidence for this um, practice, I found a study out of Australia where they actually adopted like uh, we did in London to treat um, ridiculous symptoms in uh, athletes um, who basically complain about tight hamstrings, tight calves, or even sometimes in comparison with, with a muscle injury to treat this with a cortical epidural. And the interesting bit is they have shown uh, that it does not matter if on MRI scan there is a sign of a nerve root compression or not, an epidural will help uh, these exercise, these lower limb exercise induced ridiculous symptoms. In summary, my take on that is never forget the lumbar spine in any lower limb uh, injuries, uh, in particular in recurrent muscle injuries. Uh, when we come to MCL injuries, um, especially in professional sport, we are um, often under pressure to bring players back uh, early. And for this, a, lo a lot of injection therapies have been uh, used, in particularly PRP and also in the UK, quite a lot of prolotherapy. On my search for evidence, I only could find um, uh, case studies, um, although those case studies have been positive, um, then they're, they're not widespread used. And obviously, if you've got um, Recreational athlete uh, rehabilitation should always be the way forward. But looking at prolotherapy and PRP, there might be um, uh, something into it, but there should be some, some randomized controlled trials to confirm this. Again, having been trained at Queen Mary, I also need to mention uh, high volume injections for MCL and particularly chronic MCL injuries. And I've been using them in the UK, and particularly in patients who uh, had um, arthroscopies and still continue to have medial knee pain, uh, where during the arthroscopy or before, they actually had a low-level MCL injury. And um, at Queen Mary, we published this, um, and it showed actually quite uh, good outcomes. So what is used there? You just um, do under ultrasound guidance, you approach the proximal end of the MCL, and you inject quite a high volume of about 10 mils of marcane plus a steroid. So, my take on that, if there's a pressure on um, improving the healing quickly or if patients uh, didn't progress with rehabilitation, PRP or prolotherapy is a potential um, injection therapy which can be used. I put here also be aware of flare-ups because always with prolotherapy or PRP, especially around the bone, you can have a flare-up which can be sometimes quite bad for a couple of days. So just warn your patients. And obviously, High volumes are also uh, an option if you consider this for chronic MCL tears. Coming to uh, plantar fascia, um, at Queen Mary, um, we used to do, a, or we still do a, a, um, a shockwave clinic at the mile end. And um, when you've got patients who don't improve with uh, shockwave uh, um, biomechanical assessment and, and physiotherapy, um, we found that the next step, and, and that also is now confirmed in the research, is to do um, a PRP injections. Um, I also found that actually prolotherapy has similar um, outcomes in in systematic reviews in relieving symptoms in, in, in plantar fasciitis. However, I have to say, um, Injections around the plantar fascia are, are never a, a pleasant experience, and therefore I feel that um, it's probably the, the last resort. And again, shockwave is a good option. And if your um, radial shockwave hasn't uh, done um, positive, then then might well you, you should use and try a focused shockwave. Um, 
next to all the holistic approaches with weight loss and, and, and exercise. So what is the future of injection therapies? I put here, so autologous human stem cells are now out there and have been used uh, more and more widely. And again, like PRP, the, the, the proposition is, is quite appealing. Um, and um, so far, I feel it's, it's again, it's a modulation of inflammation and, and possibly uh, there might be something into it that we can improve uh, healing. Um, looking at the evidence for musculoskeletal conditions, I found um, two systematic reviews with positive effects um, on MSCs, actually um, adipose-derived uh, stem cells or bone marrow-derived stem cells on knee osteoarthritis. And interestingly, it, it seems to be a dose-dependent effect. So the more cells you have, the better the outcomes. I also put um, there, there, there are a lot of other promising um, indications. And indeed, uh, here at Aspartar, there has been some published around tendons. And it will be very exciting over the next years if we can uh, publish more on this. So the next is the importance about ultrasound guidance. When, when I started at Queen Mary to be trained by Otto Chan, uh, I've been told, Marcus, if you inject, always see the bevel before you inject ever anything, because otherwise you don't know where you're going. And indeed, um, at the time um, at Queen Mary, uh, at the Royal London, they did some research with um, registrars in rheumatology, where they uh, injected blindly a knee with dye, and uh, the failure rate was quite high. And I've, I've been told just yesterday that it was about 40%. Looking at... Um, um, Research evidence, there is good systematic review out there uh, in, in, in knee injections uh, that they're much more um, accurate. It doesn't matter which anatomical position. The same for hip injections. Obviously, hip is uh, much more difficult. Having looked at the research, uh, again, regarding not only how accurate they are, um, you get also better outcomes. Yeah? This also has been sh uh, shown in uh, several research uh, studies. Um, Next to better outcomes, um, there's also less pain and it's also more cost effective. Um, ultrasound is, is nowadays very accessible and it's also um, a quite quick learning curve. So you learn it very quickly. So for me, my take is I, I couldn't find any reasons why not to use ultrasound. So through my career, I, I I always try to uh, witness other doctors who um, have good outcomes and, and see patients. Um, and what I found that the most, <laughs> the doctors who, who had good outcomes and, and were very popular with patients, they, they had all in common. They were very empathetic with their patients. They showed a genuine interest in their patients. And I felt sometimes they were the placebo. So for me, it's quite important uh, if, you, if you deliver those things to have a positive attitude towards the delivered treatment, no matter what you do and be the placebo. And there's actually a good book out there called You Are the Placebo, which I, I, I urge you to maybe read um, how this actually could, could be possible. Having said this, I think I've presented you enough evidence um, that you consider injection therapies in your practice, because I think they are a part of uh, sports medicine and, and how we treat patients. I want to thank you all. Um, I'm always interested in new ideas and innovations, so feel, please feel free to contact me. Um, Thank you very much.